Hi, I'm Brad Settlemeyer, a senior scientist in the HPC Design Group at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And today I'm here to talk about accelerating file systems and data services with computational storage. Um, so I kind of want to have two major topics today. Uh, the first is why computational storage. And the second half of the talk, we'll talk about um, how to apply computational storage, or at least how LANL is applying computational storage um, and achieving what we think are some pretty important gains in our storage system designs. Um, but the first thing we want to talk about is what, what's changed to make computational storage relevant today? And so the first thing I want to talk about is the type of scaling that we're most interesting, interested in, in within the HPC community. Um, there's basically, as far as we're concerned, two types of scaling, strong scaling and weak scaling. And weak scaling is the notion that as you, um, as you add hardware, you also add work. Um, and so you get more throughput by adding more work or adding more hardware, but also adding more work. Um, and while that's interesting, um, and, and a very useful capacity computing paradigm. In general, within HPC, we're actually far more uh, interested in purely accelerating the time to insight. So we don't wanna increase the size of the problem. We just wanna take a fixed size problem and solve it more quickly. Um, and so the quickest way to think about this from a storage context is, what if I wanna store a 100 gigabyte file as quickly as possible? And it doesn't need to be 100 gigabytes. It can be a terabyte, an exabyte. Well, not an exabyte, a terabyte, a petabyte, whatever it needs to be. Um, and you just wanna write it out as quickly as possible. So a 100 gigabyte file, I wanna write it in you know, just a few fractions of a second. Um, and what you do is you try and start adding hardware to this is, you know, you start adding disk drives in. You're like, all right, I'm gonna take a couple thousand disk drives. I'm gonna write this 100 gigabyte file out as quickly as possible. Um, eventually you'll stop improving performance. You'll run out of, uh, you'll run out of the ability to, to overcome the latency, the, the layout and latency bounds that exist within uh, spinning hard disk drives. So you say, okay, well, I'm just gonna put in NVMe SSDs. And what you'll find is, yep, you can go really fast um, right up until you run out of your host memory bandwidth. And once you're out of your host memory bandwidth, you just can't go any faster than that, uh, no matter how many SSDs you add. And so this is kind of a microcosm of the problem that we see with trying to design storage systems to support strong scaling. Um, and so what we've done is we've kind of looked to what the processor vendors have done. Um, and so the processor vendors, um, you know, since the early 2000s, there hasn't really been much in the way of frequency increases. Cores aren't really getting faster. And so uh, the processor vendors have been stamping out more and more cores on a die. However, every once in a while, there's been these really nice one-time step functions. Um, and so one of them is the move from off-package memory to on-package memory, right? DDR to something like HBM. And this, you know, moves you from a few hundred gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth up to a terabyte per second of memory bandwidth. So quite a, quite a substantial increase. Now it's a one-time function, right? You only get this improvement once. Of course, you can find enough of these one-time functions. You're actually talking about some really um, substantial improvements in performance. Um, the other major uh, advancement we've seen here recently, and we'll talk a lot more about this, um, is specialized processing units. Um, and so in a, in a traditional, you know, um, high IPC server processor, you might think about something like AVX 512, or you might think about, you know, a better, um, a better transcoding unit, a set of specialized instructions that'll unlock a piece of hardware that is just well-tuned to achieve this particular workload. Um, and so now that begins to make us think about computational storage. Um, so computational storage, can it be one of these one-time lift-ups? You know, it's, it, sure, it's not great that we're only gonna have one-time lift-ups, but can it be one of these step functions that takes us up in performance for our storage systems? And of course, um, in many ways, I think it might be several step functions. And I'll talk more about that as we get going. So real quickly, you know, what are the three basic architectures for computational storage? Um, we have kind of three basic designs. Um, on the left, we have the computational storage device. Um, so this is where you have the kind of the simplest, the most traditional computational storage um, architecture. And you have a processor effectively on a drive. Um, and this has been called active storage in the past. Um, and this is super beneficial whenever you can actually interpret the data that's on the drive. So you, you, you have semantic knowledge about the data that's on a drive. But of course, that's very difficult to do with a block device where any particular block may have an extent of data, or maybe it's got a metadata block and just some pointers that point to somewhere in the B tree. Um, and so this can be a difficult architecture to use with just a, with a traditional block device. Um, an alternative architecture um, that matches that paradigm a little bit better is the computational storage processor. Um, and so in this picture, I just show a, an example of some kind of compute 
that's uh, attached to the same bus as the drive. And you might think, well, you know, what's the benefit of putting, you know, another server processor out there on the, the data path? And if that's what you did, there probably would be no benefit. But of course, what you can do is you can put specialized processors that maybe can do some of the functions that are really kind of unique and can be well accelerated for storage. Um, and the third and uh, kind of a little bit of a controversy, uh, controversial architecture is the computational storage array. And this is the one that we're most interested in right now at LANL. Um, and I kind of like that it's a little bit amorphous and not as well defined as the other two. Um, and this is where you have a blending of compute and storage together kind of in a unit. And you can kind of stamp out um, in a fixed ratio your compute and uh, your storage, and you can kind of uh, stamp this out in a way that uh, allows you to make this a fundamental building block of your file system. Um, and so we're very interested in this architecture. Um, we've looked a lot at all three architectures. And in fact, we're using all three architectures um, kind of depending on what kind of use cases we have. We'll talk a little bit about that at the very end as well. Um, Okay, so why do I say that we need computational storage and computational storage as a conceivable step function? So um, like, most of the, like most of the changes we make at LANL, it's data-driven. Um, we always try and be data-driven data at our lab. Um, and so this was the data from a couple of years ago that motivated us to realize we were gonna have a problem with designing our NVMe file systems. Um, and in fact, we we're gonna need to do some degree of like kind of hardware software co-design in order to get our file systems to the performance levels that we wanted. Um, so I really like these graphs and I'm going to kind of point at some of the lines here, but let's just start over here on the, on the left-hand side with the blue graph. Um, and what you can see for, is this dashed line um, that's showing the maximum performance we achieved with kind of a, a regular FIO run that replicates the file system IO. Um, we're not going to NUMA pin this thing. We're not trying to get it to the absolute best performance. We're trying to, we're trying to set a realistic baseline of what the drives are capable of um, kind of the hardware paths are capable of in a regular environment. Um, and so this is just an FIO run and you can see that it's about, you know, 18 or 19 gigabytes per second. Um, this is 10 NVMe drives. These are gen three drives. Um, and so we consider that okay performance. There's a little bit that's, you know, not, not, not available there. These, these drives are capable of about two and a half gigabytes per second, a little bit less than two and a half gigabytes per second. So we're leaving a little bit of efficiency on the floor. And if we NUMA pin that, we could probably get a, a, a bit more of it. The hardware paths are a little bit hard to work on this. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that this is an Intel Platinum server. So this is really not a dedicated storage server, but it has a ton of processing power. So this is, this is kind of a really fast processing power. You would never actually use this in a storage system. Um, but you'll, as we kind of move through these graphs, you'll see why we went back at the very end and put this on a very high-end server um, to see what's happening. So this dark graph is a regular ZFS run with just checksums enabled. So we have 10 drives. They're set up in a striped Z pool and we're writing data across all 10 of those drives. Um, and you can see that we get pretty close to that FIO performance. We're feeling pretty good about this, you know, out here at 28 or 32 threads with 10 drives. Um, you can see that we're, we're you know, within 10%, really. We're at, you know, 17 gigabytes per second or, or it's really closer to 18 gigabytes per second here that you can see on this dark blue line. Um, what's interesting are the two lighter blue lines beneath it. Um, and so what you can see is uh, we're now going to take those same exact 10 drives and we're going to shift them into what in ZFS is called a RAID Z1, so 9 plus 1. Um, and what we're going to see, we should expect to see a 10% performance drop, right? We're generating 10% more data for one of the drives, or 10% uh, of the data is now going to be parity data, so that doesn't really count towards our user base uh, throughput. Um, so we should see a 10% drop in performance. What we in fact see is something closer to like a 30% drop in performance here. I mean, as you look at these lines, you can see that the performance has dropped a good bit. Um, and so, you know, you, you begin to think to yourself, well, this is an Intel Platinum, but maybe we're somehow out of CPU. We're having to do all this additional um, erasure coding work. We're having to calculate this first parity code, this first Reed Solomon code. Um, so maybe that's, what's, that's what the issue is. Um, but then you look at the next line down, which is RAID Z2. So this is now an eight plus two configuration. So now we're down 20%. And you see that in fact, the performance didn't change at all. Now here I've asserted earlier in the talk that these server processors are not gonna be efficient for IO. And yet clearly the server processor can generate the erasure codes at the rate that we need. So what in the world am I talking about? Why is this man saying crazy stuff? Um, so now let's move to the middle graph. Um, so now what we're gonna change, um, we're gonna move to, the, to one of the original platforms we actually really noticed this on. So this is gonna be a much simpler single socket, um, second generation AMD processor. You may know it by its code name Rome. 
It's got a very flat PCA layout on this motherboard. It's a very nice motherboard for storage, 24 slots in the back or 24 slots in the front, um, network in the back. So we can build a distributed uh, file system server out of this thing very, very easily. Um, and again, we, we've got basically the same uh, hardware level performance with FIO. Um, and here you can see that we're moving down and the green line is a good bit lower. So we've actually dropping a bit of performance. Um, so, so there is some processor difference in what the file system is able to do, presumably. Um, don't wanna make too strong a statement about that. Um, but again, we can see that these two lighter colored green lines, the eight plus one and the, or sorry, the nine plus one and the eight plus two, the performance is the same, but it's again, far, far lower. It's not just off by 10%. Okay, so this was, you know, you can't quite make sense out of this result, right? It still doesn't exactly match everything I've been saying up to this point, but here we go to the, the, the graph. That's kind of the, the one that really shows what's going on. Um, so this is a first generation AMD, uh, what was called a Naples. Um, and here you can see the performance is A, far lower, and B, basically all centered around the same. There's, there's no processing overhead. They're just all terrible. So now what's going on? Well, let's talk about the memory bandwidth of these sockets. So in the Intel dual platinum, or yeah, the, the dual platinum system, a dual socket platinum system, we have 12 channels of memory bandwidth over here. In this single socket AMD, you know, server process, uh, storage server type architecture, we're down at eight memory channels. And then in this AMD Epic first generation, we have eight memory channels, but as you may know, the chiplets are actually sorted so that each chiplet can only get individually two memory channels per chiplet. Um, rather than having the unified architecture for the memory controller that, uh, that a, a ROM has. Um, and so what you can actually see, and one of the major reasons we ran it on Intel was so that we could use the perf counters, um, is you can see that we're actually limited in our ability to get data to and from memory. Um, so we're not necessarily peaking out the CPUs. What we're actually peaking out is the memory bandwidth. Um, and we really don't want to buy... Uh, dual socket platinum servers in order to just get that memory bandwidth for this. And of course, if I had put other storage functions on here, all we have is a very light load as it stands right here, checksum and erasure coding. Now those two are obviously critical for your file systems, um, but this is a very light load. If I put compression on here um, and, and a decent compression like gzip, even in the case of this platinum, we'd actually see the performance degraded to something like two gigabytes per second. We would, we would be moving from having, you know, six devices of performance maybe in this case, all the way down to one device of performance, despite the fact that I've got 10 devices in there. And it wouldn't matter whether I had RAID Z on or not. The compression, the Huffman table, the dynamic Huffman table would just crush our performance. The, the passes over memory and the inability to really effectively get that fit into L3 would just completely crush our performance. So this is, this is the kind of the data that drove us and said us, well, we really need to look at both the hardware and the software, not just from a storage device perspective, but also from a compute perspective that we're putting in our file systems. And so the final kind of trend that says, you know, here's what's going on in the computational storage and, it's, and, and what's important is you really see this proliferation of data processing units becoming available. Um, this is, you know, you really, you can't throw a rock out there right now without finding a startup that's got a new data processing unit. And that data processing unit conceivably has a very different processor than what is in your standard server. You know, those Intels and AMDs I just showed. Server CPUs are, you know, effectively wonders today. They're a multi-core, out of order, high IPC. They're going to come with massive floating point units doing IEEE 854. They're adding in more and more data types now um, for these B floats, these, these different types of floating points that have different precision. Um, we're seeing you know, vector processing units, AVX 512, ARM's got Neon, um, lots, of lots of innovation within these processors, um, transcoding instructions. And that's great. I'm really glad that, that the processor vendors are, are looking not just at weak scaling, but also looking at how to get other workloads um, those one-time step functions that we talked about so they can do strong, strong scaling, which we all love. Um, but whenever I'm running a server for storage, I don't really need any of that capability. Um, I mean, you know, uh, why are you going to use your floating point units? You're going to what calculate an average of a couple counters. I mean, you just don't have, uh, you don't have all this capability built into your storage servers, or at least we at LAN will don't. Um, and so what we really need is we really need um, to have probably smaller kind of right-sized server processors. But what we also need are 
um, specialized units that are going to be good at the kind of functions that we do within file systems. Um, so slim down processing elements with higher memory bandwidth per instruction. Um, and the one thing I'll say about it is um, really the most important piece. So if, if the server processors, you know, cost zero dollars, obviously I would just put them everywhere along the storage path, but that's not really the case. They're just too complex and too expensive and too general purpose. And so instead what we're seeing is that the data, the data processing units um, are actually right-sized for our calculation and the economics are very compelling. Um, and whenever you do that economic analysis, and I've talked about that in some past talks, um, you can't really just look at performance. Well, you could, um, but I wouldn't suggest it because really what you have to think about is data protection. And you have to think about how much extra capacity is compression buying you. There's all these other, and you know, by reducing your, your server count and your host count uh, you know, from hundreds of servers down to tens of servers for a storage system, how much is your TCO dropping in terms of your administration costs and how much do your, your admins love you compared to how much they hated you before? Um, all these things become, become relevant in that. And the economics become, at least for LANL, very compelling um, as we start to look at that. These data processing units um, can really drive um, pretty substantial savings in, in, in our estimation uh, at LANL based on the pricing that we get. Obviously your pricing may vary and the trends may change tomorrow. Um, so we don't really, you know, you always have to continue, you know, always look at your economics. That's that's part of storage system design. But as we look at it today, what computational storage looks like, that's a big win for us. Okay, so how is LANL deploying computational storage? Um, I think this is, you know, applied computational storage. It's easy to talk about, but it's hard to do. Um, and in particular, um, we have a couple high level requirements that really, that really make this uh, difficult for us. And so we've had to write a little bit of code to get this to work for our file systems. And I wanna talk about that little bit of code. And I wanna also say that it's available for you guys to go download and use on your own. Um, so file systems at LANL by and large have two characteristics that, that are gonna impact computational storage quite a bit. One, those file systems exist in kernel. Uh, we do run some user space kernels or sorry, some user space file systems or some file systems that run services in user space, but by and large for the real large scale data, you know, the petabytes and petabytes of data that we're running at LANL, those file systems exist in kernel. Um, just the security advantages of that and the aspects of that, um, it's just the way we currently do it. Not necessarily tied to it, but it is the way that it works. Um, similarly, um, all of our file systems today leverage block devices. Uh, we do not use exotic devices today. Um, we have a lot of interest in those exotic devices. I'm very interested in alternative interfaces. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that at the, big, at, the, at the very end and some of the additional gains that we think are possible through those. But we leverage block devices, whether it's NVMe devices or hard disk drives. Um, we, use, we use them in a block device format. Um, and finally, um, we recognize based on the data that we have, we need a mechanism for accelerating, and this is the important part, in kernel file system functions. Now, the good news is we know what those functions are. Um, erasure coding, checksums, compression, dedupe, very standard storage functions. These are the ones that we're most interested in. These are the ones that we're gonna deploy. Um, erasure coding and checksum, obviously we've gotta have, and then compression and dedupe to buy you capacity. Those can be big wins um, on some of our file systems. Some of the data can be pretty hard. Um, and we don't exactly know the answer to where to put uh, the processing entirely along the data path. There's still a lot of degrees of freedom. So we want to have some flexibility in how we do that. However, we know that we do want to deploy processing along the data path. Um, so we need, we, need a, we need some shim code that will allow us to move it around as these proliferating DPUs become available and we figure out exactly where we want them, whether it's a, you know, a Xilinx uh, based smart NIC that has an HBM buffer on it that's, you know, awful, uh, awfully fast, or whether it's a, um, you know, a, a, a U2 FPGA or some specialized custom processor from uh, a set of vendors. I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we've got going on at the end with some specific names, but um, I'll be kind of vague right now. Okay, so this is a traditional file system processing pipeline for the file systems we use at LANL. Um, okay, so here's what's going on. We have a write system call from user space. We're gonna now copy that data from user space into kernel space. And we're gonna pass this through a set of transformations before we issue the IO to a set of devices. And this is actually, this final issue will be to a set of block devices. So we'll read, it, we'll read in, I don't know, a four megabyte buffer from user space. And this thing's gonna get chopped up and diced up so that we can spread it across. But the first thing we'll do um, in most of our file system 
workloads is we're going to compress the data. Um, then we're going to apply checksums. Um, if you're using CFS, you'll have like this complex Merkle tree of checksums where the checksums are um, asynchronously built on top of one another. Um, there's other checksumming approaches that are used by file systems for data integrity. When you start talking about multi-petabyte data stores, you really have to have some extra checks for data integrity. And finally, we're going to need erasure code because failures happen. We're cool with that. Um, sometimes too many failures happen and we need priority rebuilds. Um, we'll talk about that at the very end, but we definitely need an erasure code so that we can take uh, device failures. And finally, you're going to issue an IO out to the NVMe IO, um, the, the NVMe infrastructure. And this is because um, by and large, we use computational storage with our fastest file systems. And that's been where we have first identified this problem. However, we're now seeing that there's, as we've learned more and more about computational storage, there's actually very substantial avenues for computational storage with disk drives as well. So um, I'll talk a little bit about how we organize our file systems into like a high performance solid state disk file systems and uh, the, our capacity um, organized hard disk drive file systems. Okay, so we went into the file system and we said, well, we've got to modify this pipeline. We're getting stuck on the ability to get memory bandwidth through these servers. We don't want to put, you know, really, really high end um, processors in these servers that are mostly idling just so we can get more memory bandwidth channels. We really just want more memory bandwidth channels by and large. Um, and we really don't want all these extra units. I don't do transcoding inside of my file systems. I don't do a lot of these other operations. Um, so this is what we've uh, this is what we've kind of built. Um, so this is a notional diagram. It doesn't have all the details, um, but I'm going to give you a pointer to the GitHub so you can get as many details as you want. Um, all right. So we've got this still the same high level diagram here along the bottom. Copy, compress, check some erasure code. Um, and what we do is we've added in a kernel module that we call the DPU services module that allows us to flexibly use DPUs however they exist within the system. Um, and basically, whenever the, the data gets copied from user space, um, if it's a direct file system write, um, it depends how the file system gets, if it gets data from the network, obviously we'll land it from a network buffer into a file system buffer. Um, so we'll, we'll land this data into the file system. And the very first thing that we'll do is we'll actually push that buffer out to the DPU services module. So we're gonna do a copy to the DPU services module. We're actually gonna get this on the hardware that the DPU is. So we have a, a pinned DPU buffer that we can use. And we're now gonna swizzle that pointer so that the file system now has kind of like a, a not exactly a far pointer, but um, a pointer uh, that, that is a handle to a DPU buffer. Um, so where we, you've, you've now don't have the real data inside of the file system. And what you're gonna do instead is you'll now hook these calls, um, compress, check some erasure code, and you're gonna pass those out to the DPU and let the DPU perform those, hopefully in a much more efficient manner. Um, and so it'll perform compression, it'll ret return control messages saying, yes, the data compressed this much, we should store the compressed version, or no, the data barely compressed, please don't store the compressed version, you're gonna get killed on the, on the decompress. Um, the checksums will be calculated. We actually take a blended approach to checksums. Some checksums we calculate on the host, some we calculate on the DPU. It very much depends. Um, we need a great deal of flexibility here. This is one of the trickier problems uh, for some of our file systems. Um, erasure coding, again, we wanna do our, our read Solomon, maybe a read Solomon two, um, you know, some kind of N plus two uh, erasure code protection. We wanna do that again out on the DPU SM. Um, but most importantly, we want to take this last step and we're going to want to do a peer-to-peer -peer DMA from the DPU directly to the NVMe IO. We don't really want to have the host involved in that. We want to, once we've gone to the trouble of paying to get the buffer out there, um, we want to do the, we want to issue the IO and return the control message and then return and then, you know, tell the CPU, all right, you've got another, another buffer that you can try and reuse here and um, try and take a handle to. Um, as we as we do our file system. And so we, we've added this shim layer of software here, this DPU SM, the DPU services module, that gives us the ability to um, push, push these calculations out to uh, an alternative, but still in kernel processing element. Um, and this has been the, this has been the piece that we needed. A lot of computational storage efforts exist in user space. There's lots of DPUs that work well in user space. But we really need our DPUs to work in kernel space because we have these in kernel file systems. Um, and so this is again, a very, very high level diagram. Um, what you can see is you have your Linux VFS, you've got your file system underneath it but it could be MDADM, right? There's no reason why you couldn't build an MDADM plugin that uses something like this. Um, 
Then we have our DPU services module. This is the piece we built at LANL. Um, it's got kind of two APIs. It's got a user API that it's going to export out to the file system. Um, it's a set of calls so that you can hook it. There's all the API is dynamic. You don't have to overload all. A DPU doesn't need to implement the entire services module. It can implement only what it's good at. Um, and we also support reconfiguration so that you can turn operations on and off. Talk about that at the very end. That's one of the big wins that we found. And there's also a provider API over here on the left-hand side. Um, and that provider API um, allows people to, or DPUs, uh, vendors to plug in their own, their own processing stack that'll call into their hardware in an efficient way. And of course, we've hooked you know, an allocate buffer. We've hooked a, um, a, a compression and erasure code, a dedupe, um, a rebuild, um, all the kind of functions that we need. Um, we have a couple providers that we've just built um, for our own so that we can do testing. And it's actually important for us to kind of have a software provider. Um, and we have a null provider so that we could make sure our, our overheads were not, we weren't putting too much overhead in. Um, and there's also a new type of provider that we're that we've been working with some vendors where they're doing actual standards compliant providers. So maybe like a TP4091 NVMe provider. Identicom is is working hard to build something like that um, with their no load providers. Um, and these providers can register and then they'll take the calls from the DPU services module. Um, so the code is available on GitHub. Um, it's called dpusm.git. Um, that we're still waiting on the license from the Department of Energy. It'll be dual licensed under GPL v2 and BSD, um, as, as that's kind of the, the lab's policy is to always license everything as BSD, and then we need GPL2 so we can use it in the kernel. Um, and that should be available imminently. Um, I don't know exactly when the final approvals will come through, but we've been using this code uh, within our file systems. Um, and so I guess the final thing to really talk about is, you know, where where are we using this? So we've been deploying accelerators currently as PCA add-in cards. So we've been using some FPGAs um, that are in PCIe form factors. We've been using some FPGAs that are in U.2 devices. We've been looking at some embedded risk processors along the data path. Um, I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, trying to work with some real visionaries in this field. Um, a lot of the vendors are super smart, um, doing great work on this. The 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 people on the SNEA CSS committee and the NVMe TP4091 working group, just um, super smart people doing really cool work on the computational storage, uh, advancing computational storage. The two big wins that we have found uh, here in the relative near term. So we've been able to switch from a very bad line rate compression to a high value compression implemented on an FPGA. This is with the NOLA Identicom uh, work, but we've been able to implement a, a, to a high value compression. And the compression is seven times faster in this case. Um, so we get, our, we, we get our compression increase from 1.06 to 1.26 to one um, with the, with the um, accelerator card. And at the same time, we're getting 14 gigabytes per second per FS instance, um, which is, you know, that's not bad. 14 gigabytes per second is a very good, uh, very good number to have your full stack with compression, erasure code, checksums, the whole, the whole ordeal there um, being orchestrated. Um, so we feel pretty good about that. That's a that's a very uh, it's a very nice switch um, for our fast storage systems to be able to do this. And it's actually this is even interesting for some of our slow storage systems, um, our capacity storage systems. As I've said, we have our systems organized into both um, kind of the high performance solid state tiers and then the lower performance, a um, little bit harder to use disk tiers, but are much more capacious. A lot more devices backing them. Obviously, just for the for the economics of this, we're trying to to split those two requirements as much as possible. Um, and so this is this has been really um, transformational for trying to achieve the levels of performance we want out of uh, out of these types of file systems. Um, another another um, configuration with computational storage that we're super excited about is um, being able to take what we've configured with the DPUSM to be a fast write path and turn it into a fast rebuild path. So whenever we have a high priority rebuild, so for example, you're changing some firmware and you're bouncing tons of servers, you know, you're doing a rolling upgrade as you as you firmware upgrade your, your disk drives or something like this. Um, during that, whenever the drives are quite old, we might see a large amount of dropout. Um, and whenever we have a large amount of dropout, we really don't want to 
be worried about optimizing compression performance, we're, we're more than happy to trickle data in. What we really want to do is we want to optimize rebuilds at that point. And so having the ability to take the DPUSM and send out the reconfigure call so that we can actually convert from a write optimized path or a read optimized path where we've got you know, all of our units focused on those workloads at the time, we can actually switch it to be a high priority rebuild so we can turn the rebuilds around as quickly as possible. Uh, this has been something that's important. It's really, um, without going too far into the details on this, it really minimizes the data movement that occurs. Um, that's one of the major benefits. We don't have to pull data all the way back to some host processor. We can hit it into some DPU that's much, much nearer to storage and not put um, as much perturbation um, on our network in that case, on our storage, on our kind of a storage area network in that case. Um, and so this has been real, real, um, real important to our high priority rebuild scenarios. We're very interested in correlated failures. We're, um, we're at the scales where we're beginning to see correlated failures within our data center where, you know, um, a little bit of cooling difference left to right in our data center can be uh, can start to be enough of a, a, a failure difference that we, we, we're beginning to get a little bit worried about how our data is getting laid out. And we've talked in the past about how we're looking at more and more data protection uh, scenarios and how to improve those data protection uh, calculations that we're doing. Um, and this is kind of the culmination of that work where now we can we can take that strategy and we can actually do fast rebuilds uh, using dedicated hardware. Um, so those are just two of the big gains that we've seen. Obviously, we're deploying um, we're deploying computational storage uh, currently primarily in our NVMe file systems, looking a little bit, um, beginning to explore doing this more and more with our disk file systems in particular for that uh, priority rebuild case. Um, and one of the big things that we're doing is we're working with all these visionaries on these committees, uh, these companies, um, uh, as part of the efficient mission-centric computing consortium, EMC3 it's called. Um, this is one of the big efforts in LANL to really partner and try and advance kind of computational frontiers. Uh, computational storage is just one part of this. There's people doing other stuff that uh, I'm, I'm less of an expert on, um, but this is, this is one of the things we're doing. We're working, we've got a, a great effort going on right now with um, Ideticom and Aeon Computing, um, NVIDIA and SK Hynix as Solab to uh, look at how to kind of revolutionize, we believe, uh, storage enclosures. I think we've got some really cool work going on there. Um, there's lots of other efforts going on, lots of other great partners within the consortium working on us with, uh, within EMC3 on computational storage. It's too many to name, quite honestly. Um, but just really fantastic. Uh, lots of them work on the standards uh, groups within NVMe and SNEA. Um, just really doing uh, fantastic work. Those guys are such experts and so generous with their time to explain things to me. I appreciate it so much. Um, we've been prototyping these hardware architectures, really trying to drive um, new architectures that we think will be more flexible as we can now reduce the number of hosts, um, hopefully a lot in our storage systems, make them much cheaper to manage, much simpler to manage, not have quite, quite so much overhead just from people and operational cost and monitoring cost. Um, and where I really think where we're beginning to look now, where we've, you know, as we, as we kind of, we've got these block services, we're feeling very comfortable with this. We're now kind of moving much more into, all right, now let's begin to really focus about that CSD use case I talked at the beginning where, all right, I want to be able to semantically interpret data near the device. And there's a lot of ways of accomplishing this. Um, we have two very promising approaches that we're looking into, um, advanced metadata services that can tell you an awful lot about what's stored, um, maybe on a device in an enclosure, um, maybe not just on your device, but on the devices near you um, so that you can build large distributed indexes so that you can very quickly search the data. We've seen some thousand X uh, performance improvements in trying to do those kind of use cases. We're also super interested in key value devices. That's a very natural um, interface for being able to interpret the data near the device. Um, and so these are all big efforts that we're pushing on. That's, uh, that's what we plan. That's where we're planning to go uh, in the near term, or at least are, are the next set of major evaluations that we're performing. Um, so I think there's, you know, it's not just that computational storage is, is useful and interesting today, but I think it also kind of opens up these new vistas of what we'll do whenever we can semantically interpret data in your device. And I don't think it'll make, you know, our file systems go away, but it'll bring new services to and make them possible. Um, I'm really excited by this whole effort and really believe that um, a lot of strong scaling benefits where we are going to be able to get 
fixed amounts of work done much, much faster um, using computational storage and the step functions like compression and hardware accelerated analytics um, and being able to really drive those into our storage systems. So that's all I had planned to talk about. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and your interest and uh, see you all soon.